Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage. And I just saw the new Indiana Jones movie. The Diarrhea of Dysentery. I mean, The Dial of Destiny. It wasn't quite as bad as I was expecting, but that's not high praise. I guess I'll just quickly mention a few things this movie does right. It maintains a consistent tone. That was one of the big problems with The Temple of Doom. That movie had this really dark stuff in it, like child slavery and human sacrifice and stuff like that, but Spielberg or Lucas, whoever, was worried that was too dark, and they tried to offset it by throwing in all this dumb, goofy humor. So you get that culturally insensitive dinner scene where they're all eating the monkey brains. That part where the dude throws the hammer and it bonks that guy in the head. All of Willie's annoying histrionic overreactions to everything. That stupid kid who yelled every single line he had and you could barely understand him. And the result is you get this movie that feels like a Saturday morning cartoon in which a dude gets his heart ripped out. And there's nothing like that in Dial of Destiny. Another thing this movie does right is it doesn't have any of that stupid self-aware humor like in the Marvel movies, or the, the Star Wars sequel trilogy. You know, that thing where the movie calls attention to its own tropes, or it undercuts the drama of a serious moment by having a character do something unexpected, like in The Force Awakens when Kylo Ren has Poe on his knees, and he's just glaring at him, and Poe's like, uh, so who talks first? Do I talk first? You talk first? Like literally a minute or two after he saw his friends get executed by the very same guy he's now making fun of. I know we were all worried that Dial of Destiny would do that, but it doesn't. Now, my biggest worry was that they were going to use time travel as an excuse to retcon the whole franchise and have it start over with a new gender swap replacement for Indiana Jones. They didn't do that either. My next biggest worry was that they were going to have the new female lead, Helena, just completely emasculate Indiana and be better than him at everything. They did do that. Because every movie now has to have the strong female character now. And she just, she just has to be the smartest, most competent, and most capable character. Which of course really just means every male character has to be made dumb and useless so she can constantly be right about everything and be the one to save everyone. Because Sarkeesian forbid you have a woman in need of rescue in current year. I think there's one scene where Indy actually rescues Helena near the end. But for the most part, Helena's the one outsmarting everyone. And not because she's smart, even though that's what the movie wants us to believe. But because everyone else is just stupid. Speaking of which, there, there's this one kind of stupid scene where Helena is being forced by the bad guys to decode a Polybius square, which will reveal the location of the next MacGuffin. And it's revealed that she has this, uh, a stick of dynamite in her pocket, which she shows to Indy, so she's clearly planning to escape. But then she tells the bad guys what the Polybius square says, when she could have just lied. But I guess she didn't think of that, or rather the writers didn't think of it. Now keep in mind, Helena is portrayed as a super genius who just magically knows everything. She knows even more than Indy, who's been doing this kind of stuff for decades longer than her. Yeah, it's one of those. And not only is Helena a know-it-all, she's incredibly smug about it. She's just constantly talking down to Indy, and it just... it makes her really unlikable. You just want to see her get punched in the face. Not that it would matter if she did though, because people don't get injured in movies anymore. You know, in, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, there's that famous where doesn't it hurt scene where she's on a he's on a boat with Marion and he's all bruised up because he just fought the big guy in the plane and nearly got crushed by a truck after getting shot in the arm. And remember, after he gets shot, he fights a guy who punches him in the arm because he knows it'll hurt. And it puts Indy at a huge disadvantage in the fight. So him getting injured actually has consequences. In Dial of Destiny, there's a part where Indy gets shot in the chest. And he's, he's just still going around fighting people like it's no big deal. Like the movie just forgets about it until the end when it suddenly needs to matter again. It's the sort of thing that leads me to suspect the ending was changed at some point in post, because they just reworked whatever footage they already had. And that's reflected in the very way this movie was shot. Which brings me to my next point. The cinematography sucks. If you watch the old movies, even Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, they all have that Spielberg feeling to them, with a lot of long takes and complex blocking and staging. But they don't make movies like that anymore because modern movies are shot for coverage. 
instead of carefully planning everything and having an entire scene play out, they just shoot a scene over and over again from dozens of angles so they can pick and choose what they want in editing. By shooting a mixture of wide shots, close-ups, and inserts, they give themselves leeway to change anything at any point in post. And this is important because big movies these days always have last-minute rewrites. When they have hundreds of millions of dollars on the line, studio executives get nervous and start demanding changes based on market research and focus group testing because they want every movie to appeal to as broad an audience as possible. So at any point, an executive could say, no, cut this out so it doesn't offend demographic X. Uh, put this in to appeal to demographic Y. Cut out that line and add in this one we got in a reshoot. Get rid of that character because that actor got cancelled on Twitter. Do this to get past the Chinese censors. All creative decisions now are based on committee thinking, and that's why all movies look the same now. You can't do that complex Spielberg cinematography when you know you to, everything you shoot is going to be subject to change at the whims of some executive at any point after it's already been shot. You need to shoot everything in an efficient but generic shot reverse shot fashion with easily reproducible lighting because you need the flexibility to cut out or add things in editing without having jump cuts and continuity errors. So you need isolated close-ups of actors and their reaction shots so you can have something to cut away to when you're adding and removing dialogue and inserts you can cut away to if you end up cutting out big chunks of action from the wide shots. It's a mechanical, logic-driven way of putting a scene together which robs it of its expressiveness. Now, I'm not saying that every scene should be done in one long shot, because there are times when it's appropriate to use a close-up or an insert, but these big movies now just seem to be edited in this spastic way, where close-ups and inserts are used not because they enhance a scene, but because they had to hide a seam where a big chunk of the scene was cut out or shoehorned in. Now, if you've never edited a movie before, you might not know what I'm talking about, but I see this kind of thing all the time in modern movies, and it stands out to me. Except for differences in color grading, which is done in post, most movies look the same now, and it's largely due to this non-style of filming. Watch any action movie from the past 10 years, and see if you can find a shot that lasts longer than 4 seconds. Well, action movies are supposed to be fast-paced, so of course there's gonna be a lot of cuts. Then watch any of the other Indiana Jones movies. Those are action movies, but they still have moments where it just holds on a shot for a while, so you can get a good sense of where everything is in relationship to each other, helping to create a sense of realism that aids in the suspension of disbelief that's necessary for these kinds of movies to work. In modern movies, even a scene of two people just sitting and talking will have a cut every one to four seconds, and I just explained why. That's what Dial of Destiny is. It's a generic action movie with the skin of an Indiana Jones movie, but it doesn't feel like an Indiana Jones movie. Not just because of the way it's shot, but because Indiana Jones himself doesn't feel like the same character. You can argue that he's old now, so of course he's changed. He's not as fit and agile as he used to be, and a lot can change over the course of 15 years. But I would argue that that's just a, that's a good reason why they just shouldn't have made the movie in the first place. No one wants to see their childhood heroes as defeated old men who are miserable and just waiting to die. No one wants to see Indiana Jones in his 80s, living alone in a crappy little apartment, yelling at his neighbor for playing his music too loud, and complaining about the plate in his leg. And yes, I understand why he's depressed, I'm not going to say why because that would be a spoiler, but there being a reason why he's depressed doesn't address that making him depressed was a bad storytelling decision. This movie is banking on nostalgia, but this isn't the Indiana Jones we remember. And we're never going to get the Indiana Jones we remember back because Harrison Ford is too old now. But Disney just can't let a franchise end. They have to make it slowly die in front of our eyes. It's like watching your grandpa slowly wither away in a nursing home with a tube up his nose. No one wants to see that. No one wants that to be their final memory of someone they loved. You want to remember them riding off into the sunset after a great triumph, not sitting in a wheelchair with the balls marinating in their own piss. But that's what Dial of Destiny is. It's piss balls. Alright, so what else is there to talk about? Uh, there's this dumb kid who doesn't do anything until the end of the movie, when the, the movie needs someone other than Indy and Helena to fly a plane. Before then, the only thing he does is he just wanders off for no reason when they're in a strange city, like some kind of idiot, and just happens to run into the bad guys and gets captured. 
Uh, and you know how every other Indiana Jones movie has him fight a big guy near the end of the second act? Well, there's this humongous bad guy in the movie, and you think, well, surely they're not gonna have this old man fight this guy, so how are they gonna deal with him? And what ends up happening, without spoiling it, is one of the characters kills him in this anticlimactic, indirect way. And you don't actually see the guy die, so I was expecting he would turn out he survived somehow, and he would show up again later, but that doesn't happen. He just kind of disappears from the movie. When you have a guy that big in a movie like this, you expect someone to fight him at some point, but that just doesn't happen. There's also this sort of subplot, which I hesitate to even call a subplot because it doesn't actually go anywhere. Uh, Helena steals the MacGuffin from Indy. And fortunately, John Rice davies reprises his role as Mr. Brownface, and he just happens to know that Helena's bringing it to whatever country to sell it at an auction at a hotel that's owned by a mob boss. But it turns out that Helena used to be engaged to the son of this mob boss, who just happens to show up. I don't think it's ever explained why Helena had to go all the way there to sell the MacGuffin at an auction when she could have just sold it someplace else where she isn't likely to run into her homicidal ex-boyfriend, but he shows up coincidentally at the same time as the bad guy played by Mads Mikkelsen and his goons. And he's mad at Helena, so a big three-party chase ensues, and Helena and Indy drive those stupid three-wheel things. After a chase that goes on forever, Indy and Helena decide to team up, and then that mob guy just disappears from the movie. The only reason that guy was in the movie at all was to facilitate a car chase, which would have happened anyway because Mads Mikkelsen showed up. So it was just really a completely pointless character. I guess maybe they felt the need to give Helena a backstory to explain why she needs money, because she has gambling debt and needs to pay off money she owes to a, to a mob boss, which of course doesn't make her any more sympathetic. They could have just said she needs money to, you know, pay for her mother's surgery or something, and made her seem at least kind of noble so we would like her at least a little bit. But no, despite her being some kind of super genius, she pissed away all of her money gambling and got into debt with a mob boss. Since I brought up the chase, I guess I should mention that the action is okay, but it doesn't really do anything better than any of the older movies, except for maybe Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. There's CGI, but it's not as obvious as in Crystal Skull, and the action in general is less cartoony than it is in that movie. And that's really the biggest problem with Crystal Skull. The action is just so over the top and unrealistic that you feel like you're watching a Looney Tunes cartoon. And you might say you shouldn't expect realism from a movie about aliens, but even in fantasy and sci-fi movies, we need a, a, a baseline level of realism. You need to know what can and can't happen according to the movie's internal logic and believability requires consistency. So when you establish that Indiana Jones can survive, locking himself in a refrigerator which gets thrown by a nuclear explosion and he crashes into the ground like a meteor and it doesn't even, he doesn't even get bruised from it, then you've established that he's indestructible and there's no reason to feel any tension from that point on. You know he, he's not gonna get punched to death if he can survive that. So our investment in the story gets jettisoned in favor of a big dumb CGI spectacle. It's the reason the tank fight in The Last Crusade is so much more exciting than the stupid jungle chase in Crystal Skull, despite the latter being so much faster and flashier. One is believable, the other one isn't. Speaking of CGI, there's a scene where Indy and Helena go scuba diving to find the thing on a sunken ship, and they get attacked by eels. There's no snakes in the movie, we, we, we get eels instead this time. And of course, Indy has to be rescued by Helena. I mean, I can barely even remember what happened in that scene because of course this, the, the eels are CGI. And I'm at the point where I just kind of zone out whenever I see someone fighting a CGI monster in a movie. Modern movies just don't have the same magic that older movies had. You never wonder how anything was done anymore because you can just say, oh, some guy rendered it on a computer. It's not to say that CGI artists don't put in tons of effort to make things look good, but when you know the actors are just in front of a green screen or blue screen and everything else was done after by some guy sitting at a computer, it just doesn't feel the same. I mean, yeah, old movies had matte paintings and rear screen projections and stuff like that, and no one would argue that they always looked better than modern special effects, but that's not the point. When you have a physical thing in front of the camera, it just feels different because you know it's actually there. 
Like, think about The Thing from 1982 and compare it to the prequel from 2011. The CGI in the prequel is bad, yeah, but that it's not like the puppets in the original look totally real either. But that's not the point. It's like, why do some people buy vinyl records instead of listening to Spotify? Or why does anyone go to the theater when they can just watch a movie on some streaming service at home? Why go to a restaurant where you could just put something in the microwave? Why not, why not go for the cheaper, easier, and oftentimes better option? Because it's just not the same experience. Just like how there's something about going through the effort of picking a record off the shelf and carefully placing it on the turntable, or driving to the theater and waiting for the movie to start with your bag of popcorn, you kind of lose something when you can just press a button and start it without any forethought. It makes it trivial. You go from, I'm gonna pick out a record and listen to some music, to I'm gonna click on whatever for some background noise. You go from, I'm gonna plan my day around seeing this movie and it's gonna be an event, to let's just pick something on Netflix to kill a couple hours. The problem with CGI is that it can do anything and it can do it easily. That sounds like a good thing, but the irony is that it actually limits imagination because filmmakers don't have to think to solve problems. It just makes it easy for filmmakers to just run with whatever dumb ideas pop into their heads without thinking it through, and it gives them the ability to change anything if they change their minds afterward. You know, some of the most famous scenes in the history of cinema were done the way they were because of technical limitations. Like, think of the shark POV scenes in Jaws, which were done because they couldn't get the mechanical shark to work on the days they shot those. But now, filmmakers just go nuts, and they know they can just always change anything at any point in post-production, so they don't even have to worry about getting anything right the first time, which is just feeds into the so-we-can-change-it-later attitude I talked about earlier. Just like how streaming and digital music make entertainment trivial, CGI makes special effects trivial. I mean, at least when compared to the things they were doing in the 80s and 90s. Here's another analogy. You can paint on a canvas, or you can paint in Photoshop. You can get good results with either, but there's no control Z on a canvas, so you better know what you're doing. Now, all that said, the CGI isn't bad in Dial of Destiny, which is about the minimum you would expect from a $300 million movie. It starts with a prologue where we see a digitally de-aged Harrison Ford, who I guess was played by a different actor and they just CGI'd Harrison Ford's head onto him, and it looks okay for the most part, except when he talks. I can't put my finger on it, but something about it just looks off, like whenever his mouth moves. You might say that's a minor thing, but the thing is, it's a distraction. When I'm being distracted by the uncanny valley effect, I'm not focusing on the story. But that, that's the only CGI effect that stood out as particularly bad. And it's only for maybe the first 10 or 15 minutes of the movie. And that prologue also happens to be the best part of the movie. Probably because Indiana Jones isn't a sad old man. Comparing it to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull again, Indiana Jones was old in that movie, but he still, for the most part, felt like Indiana Jones. Just an older, more mature, and less agile version of that character. I mean, it was pretty ridiculous to see a 65-year-old man doing the same stuff he did in his 30s, but like I said, no one wants to see their heroes get old. In Crystal Skull, they were in denial of the fact that Harrison Ford was getting old, but now that he's in his 80s, they couldn't really pretend this time. So now, in Dial of Destiny, he's just old and miserable and doesn't even feel like the same character. It's not just the fact that he's old. Aside from him being made cowardly and stupid to prop up Helena, there's a part where he knocks over a bunch of shelves with artifacts on them to escape from the bad guys, which is not something Indiana Jones would have done. The real Indiana Jones would have risked his life to save those artifacts. Remember, he stole the Cross of Coronado from those guys who wanted to sell it, and he almost got killed several times in the ensuing chase. That's Indiana Jones, not some miserable old man who gets talked down to by some smug, unlikable new Coke co-star who's meant to replace him. The ultimate problem with Dial of Destiny is it just doesn't feel like an Indiana Jones movie. It feels like the death of the Indiana Jones franchise. It feels like Lucasfilm under the control of Disney, cashing in the last of their nostalgia chips. I mean, what's left to ruin? 
They've run Star Wars into the ground, and they botched Willow so bad that they took the Disney Plus series off the surface entirely, so now there's no legal way to watch it. Are they gonna bring back Strange Magic? Disney also owns Marvel, so maybe they can make another Howard the Duck movie. I hate everything. Alright, that's it. Like this video, subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Leave a comment for the algorithm and support me on Patreon. Bye.